Good afternoon, everybody. Nice meeting you. Thank you for your attention. I would like to first introduce myself so you know who is the alien who is talking to you. My name is Shaya. Some people call me Rabbi Tenenbaum. I was born and raised in Israel, as you can tell on my accent. I came to the States and actually a very um, interesting time, 2001, September 10, one night before the tragedy. So always I have an easy way to remember how many years I'm in the States. I, was, I, was, I just want to mention that I was never taught English. In, in Israel I was speaking Hebrew and Yiddish and the English I have is just from friends, family and uh, from the street. So forgive my English if it's not uh, that uh, 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 perfect. But um, as long as you understand my meaning and my, uh, my point. So I came to the States first as a student, as a Jewish student, what we call a yeshiva student. Yeshiva is a Jewish school. I uh, got married a few years later to a very nice Jewish girl from New York. And a few years later we moved to Florida, but not to this part, to the south, South Florida. I'll explain what, I, what I'm doing here in this area. South Florida was too Jewish for me. <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> the problem is, the issue is, that I am a Chabad, part of the Chabad movement, if you heard of it. And we were uh, educated and taught and got the, the responsibility and the caring from a very great man, Rabbi Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, if you heard of him, passed away in 1994. And he basically gave us the teaching, the caring, and you can say even the responsibility of going all around the world. And today you can find Chabad all over the world. I personally actually have the, the, had the problem that I wanted to go on a certain Chabad mission, outreach, outreach mission, and was no place, everything, everything was taken. So finally I went to South Florida and I was teaching and doing some Jewish, uh, whatever a Jewish rabbi is supposed to do, but I felt I'm not doing enough. There are so many rabbis, so many synagogues, Jewish temples, so many Jewish organi organizations. I finally came here, and as, as far as I understand, there is one more rabbi in the entire, that one more Orthodox rabbi in the entire Emerald Coast, except for me. So uh, we have a lot of responsibility, him and I, and we're trying to fit ourselves to this. This is regarding myself. Now regarding my speech, I was asked by Mr. Smith to speak about Judaism. I was asked to do the impossible. It's a nation and religion of four or three thousand years. And to speak about it in one hour, it's very challenging. Don't worry, I'm not going to speak for three thousand years. <laughs> not even for four thousand years. Even though it might, it might feel so, but I'm just going to speak for one, one hour and maybe even less. Actually, I, I remember uh, one of the rabbis in Israel, a very great speaker, always when he would go, out and, uh, go to speak, he said, don't look at your watch. When I speak, don't look at the watch. Just look at the calendar. <laughs> don't worry, in my speech you can look at, the, at, the, at your watch. So what can I speak in one hour? What topics? The Judaism, it's all my life. There's so many, so many aspects, historical, philosophical, psychological, 
religion, many, many aspects. I just thought about a very similar situation of a non-Jewish man. By the way, do, does everybody hear me? Okay. Non-Jewish man who came about 2,000 years ago to the great, to the top two, to the top two great, greatest rabbis of that time, one was Hillel and one was Shammai. Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai. He came first to Shammai, who was known as, as a very strict rabbi, one who goes by the book, by the law, doesn't, doesn't play around, doesn't find the easy way, just any, for his bad luck, he went first to him. And he said, Rabbi, teach me the entire Torah while I'm standing on one foot. As I said, Shammai was not as a easygoing person, Rabbi. He didn't like this request. He, was, uh, he happened to be holding in his in his hand, a, um, a kind of measuring stick, something like you, you measure with. And he basically showed him the way out quickly by saying, are you crazy? We studied the Torah for 120 years and we never finish. Torah, by the way, it's the, the Jewish uh, expression for Bible. We studied, the, we studied the entire Torah for, for all our life, and we never finish. There's actually a joke about a rabbi who came to a, to a big, big Jewish community. And, uh, and this was a large community, very rich community, and they would get the best rabbi in the world. They sent messengers to all over the world, and they picked the best rabbi. So one of the, one of the board of the community uh, came to see the rabbi one of the weekdays. He knocked at the door. The rabbi, uh, the rabbi's wife opens and she says, the rabbi is busy he's studying Torah. He says, what? Didn't we get the best rabbi? He's still learning? <laughs> yes, we're still learning. Every single day we study and we study. I hope so. Yes, good. No, they can hear you. Thank you. So we count the one hour from now? <laughs> <laughs> so Shammai got very upset. And he's right. He's right. Well, you want to study the entire Torah? You want to study entire Judaism in, while you're standing on one foot? It's impossible. I can do it. Why can you do it? And he told them, find the, way, find the way out. So he went to Hillel. Hillel was known as a very, very kind, lovable rabbi. There are stories, it's not the time, I'm limited. Stories, how wonderful person he was. This was his teaching, and as we're going to uh, see, and this was his, his way of life. Not like those who teach something and they live different way. But this, is, this was his way of life, to love every single person. And this non-Jew came to him and said, I want to study the entire Judaism as, while I'm standing on one foot. So he told him, oh really? No problem. Pick up one foot. Whatever you hate, don't do to your friend. That's the entire Torah. That's entire Judaism. And the rest, it's the commentary. It's the explanation of it. You can put down your foot. Put your foot down. What does that mean? Wasn't Shammai right? They, they are, in the Torah, in the, the Jewish law, 600 and 13 mitzvahs. Mitzvah is a commandment, godly commandments. There are so many 
You're probably familiar with some of them, the, the Sabbath, the Passover, the Hanukkah, different laws, kosher. So many laws. Nas, nice chunk of them is what we call mitzvot shebein adam lachavero, a commandment between men and his friend. But there are so many mitzvot, so many commandments between men and God. And how does it make sense to say when you love your friend, you love your fellow, or as he actually expressed, as I'm going to explain later, he expressed in a negative way, whatever you hate, don't do to your friend. How is this the entire Judaism? Sounds good. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. But it has to make sense too. Hillel, this rabbi, had another a, a opportunity to speak, not for a few minutes, not for uh, one moment as the person stands on one foot, but had the opportunity to speak and teach not only one person, but thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people throughout the history by the ethics of our fathers. This is part of the Torah, part of the, of the Jewish law. And there is attracted ethics. Different rabbis say different things, different ideas, philosophical, ethical, mainly. And Hillel used the opportunity to teach us as follows. Hillel Omer. Hillel says, Hevei mitalmidav shel Aharon, be from the disciples of Aaron, Ohev shalom verodef shalom, love peace and chasing after peace. And Hillel goes on, says a few, few more things, but this is what he opens with. This is his first teaching. Be like Aaron. Aaron was the brother of of Moses. Moses was the first Jewish leader who took out the Jewish people from, from Egypt, who received the Torah from God, who led the, Jewish, led the Jewish people 40 years in the desert. You know why he, le why he was walking with them in the desert and not in the... Why, why, was, why, why did they spend 40 years in the desert? He was embarrassed to, to walk with them in the street. <laughs> and just kidding. So he led them. He was the, the first and the greatest Jewish leader. His brother, Aaron, was actually older, was a special, unique man. We don't hear so much about him, but we do. The Torah, the Bible does speak about him. And, you know, sometimes you see the greatness of a person, unfortunately, only when they passed away. When they, these two giant brothers, Moses and Aaron, passed away by a godly decree, they weren't allowed to walk to the land of Israel, to the Holy Land. So right in the end of the 40 years, right before the nation goes on to continue to enter the, the land, first Aaron passed away, and then Moses passed away. And the Torah, if you see, if you look in the scripture, you see that the Jewish people mourner, uh, mourned, cried for their passing. But the scripture expresses in two different ways. One, it says Moses, when Moses passed away, all the sons of Israel, all the men cried. The rabbi, the rabbi passed away. The teacher, the great teacher passed away. They were missing, they were hurt. When Aaron passed away, everybody cried. Not only the men, not only the adults, everybody cried. Why? Moses, Moses is the greatest. Moses did so much for them. Our sages tell us 
that Aaron had a very, very unique way that each and every one of us can adapt of bringing peace between people. When he would see two people fighting, you know how it starts like a fire and turns to ice. The beginning, I hate you, I'll do this for you, we're so angry. And then after we come down, it's so, it's even in a way worse because it's so cold. No one wants to look at the face of each other and they just have nothing to do with each, with each, with each other. Which sounds not so bad, but it is very, very hurting and very, un, it's not a, a desirable. Aaron, with his special eye, would realize, we have to remember the congregation of, of the, 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 the Jewish people in the desert was a uh, millions of people, between two to three million people walking in the desert. They were very organized and, um, and the, the places they, they moved, they traveled in the desert, the Torah, the, the Bible, exactly count them, 42 places, they wandered. The way they were marching was all organized, but yet it's a large congregation. Two to three million people. And this man, Aaron, with his special eye, would realize that this person doesn't speak to that person. And this husband doesn't get along with his wife. What he would do, it's a tricky thing, it's a tricky way, he would come to one of them, not by the presence of the other, and tell him, you know, I, the one, your enemy, you, the one you don't speak to, your fellow you don't speak to, regrets so much what he has done for you, what, we, what he has done to you. He's very upset about it. He really regrets it. It hurts him. And he really wants to go and, and, and apologize to you. But... He's embarrassed after he hurt you so much. And for years, you're not talking to each other. Days, not talking to each other. He's embarrassed. He, he, he doesn't have the, 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 the tongue to say, to say that I'm sorry. And then he would go to the other one and say the same thing. And walk away. And these two people met each other at the street. Beginning looking like from far, getting closer, closer, and the smile is raising, is rising and rising until they would hug each other and be friends even more than before. And after you're friends, you have a lot, what do you have so many days or weeks or years to make up, do you talk about, and then they would realize, oh, Aaron tricked, Aaron tricked us. It was not true, he made it up. But now they're friends. So they loved him so much. That, that's why people, everybody, not only scholars, not only leaders, not only special people, but every single child, every single uh, couple in the congregation, everybody loved them because he brought peace to the world. There is something called tzedakah. In English, we call it charity. I know it's a little challenging for American to say the word tzedakah. <laughs> this is the word in, in Hebrew. In the original Hebrew, that's the, word, that's the way we say charity. What charity, for my knowledge in English, means something like kindness. Like doing something good, doing something beyond the letter of the law. Something you're not required to. Tzedakah, however, charity in Hebrew, shares the same root as the word tzedek, righteous, um, right, rights. Not beyond the letter of the law, but just the right thing to do. Why is this that right? Why if I'm not giving it tzedakah, if I'm not giving charity to a poor man, I'm considered according to the Jewish law a sinner? Well, it's nice to give, it's important to give. How can you not give? Don't you see the, pay, the pain of the person? 
But to say that it's, it's a sin, to the Torah re requires you to give tzedakah, to, to give charity. It's one step further. I want to mention something that I, uh, I would say about Aaron. I forgot to, to mention one, one, one important thing. It's not only the part, the, the part that he was helping people, but even first to realize their problem, to realize that they are in a war, in a, in a, in a, in, they don't get along. This is already a, a unique a, a character. I heard once from a, from a rabbi, from a speaker in Israel, he said, could be two people who walk by a, a, a beggar, a homeless, a person, a needy, and don't help them, don't help him. Two people, it's not good, it's not as it should be, you should help. But they don't help for two different reasons. The first one was very busy. He was involved with his work, with his phone calls, with his uh, 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 bills. And he was walking by, and he didn't realize that there is a beggar sitting on the floor and begging for a little money. Or he didn't realize that his neighbor is in a, in a, in a, in a situation he needs help. He is so much, he's so busy. He would help with all his heart. But he just didn't realize. The other one did realize, but didn't want to help. He didn't care enough. He, he thought that he can't. Whatever the excuses, they will always. There will always be excuses why not to help. He said, if you think of it, maybe many people will tell you the second is not a nice person. You see the person suffers, you see you can help him, why don't you help him? But he said the first one needs much more to work on his own character, to work on, his, on himself. How come there is somebody suffering next to you and you didn't even realize? If you don't help, you have to correct yourself. You have to work on yourself to become a better person. But at least you realize. So this was one thing of Aaron, who, who not only helped the people, but realized, among so many people, who realized who two individuals don't speak to each other. Back to, to, the, to the subject of tzedakah, of charity in English. As I said in Hebrew, it means right. Right, doesn't mean extra, doesn't mean something special, it means just right. And one can wonder, I worked so hard for my money. This person is a lazy person, whatever the excuses are, but why is my money belongs to him? It's my money, I can, get, I can do with my money whatever I want, I can buy whatever I want for myself, can help him. But is this money, let's say 10%, this is, by the way, the requirement, according to Judaism, to give at least 10% of your income to charity. So 10% of, of my money doesn't belong to me, belongs to somebody else. Why? There was one atheist who came to Rabbi Akiva, who was another great sage, who said, um, Rabbi Akiva, do you, does your God love poor people? He said, yes. So why, do, why does he make them, why make them be a poor? If he likes them, if he loves them, why makes them poor? And if he makes them poor, why ask you, the people, to help the poor people? To answer this, I will uh, quote from one of the parshas of the Torah, one of the sections of the Torah, where the, the people are required to give to, to I always have a hard time to, to express this word, a co contribution, which is a donation, it's the same thing, right? right? So to give a donation to the, to the tabernacle. It says over there, God spoke to Moses, go to the people, speak to the people, and they shall take for me a contribution, a, a donation. Why sh should they take? They should give. They should give. 
So the Lubavitch Rebbe, the, the rabbi I mentioned before, explains that in every kind of, of uh, in every act of kindness, in every act of charity, of tzedakah, you have at least two people involved, the giver and the receiver. The giver is definitely doing it, or most likely doing it, with right good intentions. He's taking away from his own money, which he can enjoy, and gives it away. However, the receiver, the poor person, takes it because uh, he's hungry. He needs it, he wants it. He doesn't have ma so many uh, uh, holy intentions in his mind when he takes the dollar. Comes the, comes the Torah and teaches, even when you receive, do it for the right purpose. You have to know that God created the world. You have to know God created the world in a way that there are rich people and poor people. And everything is planned and everything has a purpose. The rich person became rich in order to help those who don't have. And those poor people who don't have became poor in order to help the rich person, the rich people, to give them the opportunity to share, to give them the opportunity to, to do the mitzvah, to, to do the, the, the kindness. So when you receive the dollar, you're a poor person, you receive the dollar, don't only think of yourself, think that you are doing your mission in the world. You are helping this rich person to do his mission in the world. I'm not saying, uh, you know, <laughs> there's no mitzvah, there's no uh, commandment to become poor and help rich people. Yeah, we have, try to, have to try our best to be normal, to, be, to, to, to cover our, our uh, 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 expenses. But if you come to a point that you can't, this is divine. This is by God. God made you in such situation that you can be this part if, whoever, if no will be no poor people in the world, no needy people in the world, there will be no kindness. That's why tzedakah, tzedakah, charity, is just the right thing. God gave extra money to certain people. Or it's not just money. Extra power, extra uh, uh, abilities to certain people so they can help extra time for certain people they can help those who don't have that and he took away from certain people certain needs so they can be helped by those who can help when we understand this the, the, the rich person, the helper, the, the giver, has to feel that he is just doing his job in the world, he's doing his mission in the world. He should feel good about it, but he doesn't have to feel bad, he doesn't have to feel, oh, I, did, I saved the, the, world, the universe, I did so greatly, I did so much, I was just doing the right thing, I was fulfilling which is the greatest, to fulfill the mission of your creation. I fulfill my, the mission of my creation. And the poor person doesn't have to feel so bad because he is, feel, is fulfilling his mission of, the, of his creation. Now, we still have to understand the question I left before open of Hillel. Hillel who told the person who came to him and said, teach me the entire Torah, teach me entire Judaism while I'm standing on one foot. And he said, Whatever you hate, don't do to your friend. That's the entire Torah and the rest it's the commentary. Why? How about Shabbat? How about kosher? If I love him, I am a very kind person. I'm, I am a loving person. I'm a, helping everybody. I'm smiling to everybody. I'm a great person. But there are certain mitzvot that don't seem to have so much connection. Maybe some connection, but I can maybe not fulfill the laws of kosher, not fulfill the laws of Shabbat. So, this is good, but it doesn't cover this. Does a fisherman like fish? 
Does a child like candy? So why do they destroy them? If you, if you love the candy, it's candy. I want it, I want it, I love it. It's so tasty. Why you destroy it? If you love the fish, why are you killing it? We all like this, unfortunately. I love my neighbor. Actually, I happen to have here in Destin a great neighbor. Very nice man. And um, he's, a, he's a nice man. He's a helping, he's a smiling, he's always ready to help. And I love him. Do I love him? Or I love the benefits I get from him? The Mishnah, the Jewish law, says there are two types of love. Love depends on something. A, a love with a reason and a love with no reason, with no, depends on nothing. Just pure love. How do you say it? Unconditional love. A love that depends on something, once the reason is gone, the love is gone. A love that is, does not depend on anything will never be gone, will never go away. What does that mean? Um, yes, I love this person because he is uh, he's, uh, giving me a ride with his car, he's uh, cutting my grass and uh, trimming my bushes. Oh, great man. Okay, I love him. But what, uh, well, let's say he doesn't stop doing it. But when I go and biking, this person has nothing to do with it. I'll find somebody who is good at biking. When I go, when I want to speak about a book, I'll go to speak to a wise person. So if the love is conditional. The love depends on something. It's not a pure love. In a way, for, first of all, the, the reason can go away. One day you will stop cutting my bushes. And then now, uh, I don't have such a strong, a strong reason to love him. I'll remember it for a year or two or three or five. And I'll, I'll move to another city and I'll forget about it. Even if he will never stop cutting my bushes, I will just love him as much as, 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 as to do with whatever has to do with my my, my yard, my backyard, my front yard. But not with any many aspects of life, other aspects of life. And the real issue is that I don't love him. I love the benefit that I gain from him, from her, from him. So, in the bottom line, I don't love him, her. I love myself. I am the center of my life. And everything it, it measures how much is good or bad for me. If it's good for me, ah, I love it. If it's bad for me, I hate it. So, I, I, I love myself. I continue loving myself. I keep loving, I love myself. And there is no way out. You want to know why Hillel, that rabbi, expressed expressed in a negative way? He, say, he didn't tell him, whatever you love, do to your friend. He said, whatever you hate, don't do to, you, don't do to your friend. This one, a, a, a rabbi, you explained it. And said, one of the things that people really don't like is somebody counting your your problems? Somebody, you know, telling how how do you say the, the opposite of adventures? You 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 disadvantages. How you, how what are you lacking? Yeah, so you, you don't like when people say how cheap you are and how not smart you are and how whatever. Nobody likes it. What about the truth? A Am I the wisest person in the world? Most probably not. Am I the richest person in the world? Am I the kind, kindness, ki kindness person in the world? Am I the best English speaker in the world? Probably not. <laughs> so why do I still love myself? Uh, love myself. Uh, there is a, a, an expression in, 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 in a verse. Al kol pshaim For all sins, the love will cover. The love covers all sins. 
which means as long as you love yourself, even if I really, I'm, I'm honest with myself and I know I'm not the perfect person, but I am, I'm still myself. I don't, I don't divorce myself. <laughs> I don't fight with myself. I still love myself. Yeah. I, yeah, okay. I, have, I have some problems. I have some issues. I have things that I have to work on, but I still love myself. You should love your friend to such extent that as you don't like when people say negative things about you, you will never be able to say negative things about your friend because you love him or her as you love yourself. You love the other person to such extent that it doesn't matter how evil, how not wise, how not kind the person is, whatever you can say negative about the person, this is my friend. How can one reach to such a level to love another person? This is not our nature. Let's be honest. Our nature is to love ourselves and to love our benefits. If somebody is nice to me, I love him. If somebody helps me, I love him. Everything that comes and helps me. How can I love another person purely? Just, just to love the other person. For this, it doesn't, it doesn't take uh, uh, one hour, and it doesn't take while you're standing on one foot. It takes a little longer. For this, we have to focus on our physical aspect of life. Physicality is very important. Materialism is very important. It's our needs, it's our tools to, to serve God. But the real reason of our, for our creation is to serve God, to pray, to study, to help, etc. Once a person is less focused on his, on, on his or her a physicality, which, yeah, you have to take care of, of, of your needs, of your bills, of your house, of your food and everything. But you're not focused on this. You just realize that this is an, a tool to enable you to do your real mission in life then it's much, much easier and you can get to a point that you love another person as you love yourself. Because if you focus on your soul, the other person has the same soul as you. You can love the other person for no condition, for no reason, just as you love yourself. Why? Why you love yourself? Are you the greatest person in the world? No, I'm, I'm myself. The other person is also yourself. And that's what Hillel, the rabbi, told him. This is what Judaism is all about. If you can love another person as you love yourself, it means you are not selfish. It means you are not focusing just on your physicality and your materialism. But you have some mission in life. You have some spirituality in your life. This is the entire Torah. This is the entire Judaism. This is our mission in this world. The, the test for it. The proof that you reach the level that your spirituality is your main aspect of your life is when you are able to love another person as you love yourself. Any questions? May I ask you a question? How are you? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm glad I didn't put you to sleep. There was once a rabbi who, who gave a lecture in a synagogue and somebody fell asleep. Uh, okay, this happened. And uh, the person started snoring. <laughs> So the rabbi shows the person sitting next to him, to, to the snoring person, wake him up. So the one who put him to sleep, he will wake him up. <laughs> All right, is anybody here actually a, a Jewish or a, 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 has a Jewish background? 
I mean, this is uh, pretty kind for you to give uh, almost a full hour. You know, if you're a Christian, you have a Jewish background. Oh, that's true. That's very true. So here you go. Are you restoring the Torah? Pardon me? Are you restoring the Torah? No. You heard, you read about it in the... Yeah. Yes. Um, no, I happened. I, as I said, I moved here to be a rabbi in uh, Destin, and I'm. Uh, pardon me. Yes. 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 Where in a place called Kfar Chabad. It's a it's a small town near Tel Aviv. Probably heard of Tel Aviv. Where's your extended family from? Um, originally from Russia and Hungary. So did they escape from Russia? What did they do in Russia? Um, in the 40s. 40s, okay. Yeah, Russia. So I remember the uh, signs on the front of synagogues in the 1960s and 70s about freeing the Russian Jewry. Right, right. They so have they somehow... Right, they somehow made it. The 1940s, that was pretty early. Yes. Um, they were not the only ones, but uh, yeah, it's, it was a challenge. But they were there for the War of Independence? Um, I think they came right after, 1949. And Israel was established in 1948, and the war broke right then. So, uh, I saw at the Wailing Wall a lot of Say, say again. Doing what? Doing like this? Shaking? Uh, it's a, it's a habit. It's a habit. Um, I think, first of all, uh, when you stand for a long time and you pray, it's, it's just it's hard to still to stand uh, still. But um, there are, there are, there is an explanation that says that really all our uh, 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 when you pray, what you focus on is on your soul, right? Not on your not on your body so much, and uh, the soul. It says in the it says in the Bible, in the Torah, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam, God's candle is man's soul, which means our soul is is it's like a candle, and and the the, the flame always like moving a little bit, shaking. And the truth is, it says that the flame always desires to go back to its source. And if not for the material, it holds it back. Once there is nothing to burn, it goes away. So too, the soul always desires the Creator, the One above. That's the spiritual explanation. Um, do, do men and women both go to the synagogue at the same time? Uh, by us, yeah, by Orthodox, yeah, everybody goes, but we pray separately in two parts of the, of the room, or two, two different rooms which are connected. Um, Why is that? Well, we believe um, this is not the only thing, but uh, um, everybody is respected, men and women. Everybody have their own uniqueness. But we we do believe that um, too much of contact, uh, uh, closeness with between men and women doesn't bring bring to too much holiness. And when we pray to God, and right next to me sits and another lady that, you know, maybe not dressed the way, the perfect way, may bring me to different thoughts than my prayers. Now that you speak of clothing, I, I have to ask you about the hat, because I'm used to seeing Jewish people with yarmulkes. I do have a yarmulke. Well, I have the, big, the big hat. Um, this is more Hasidic. A, uh, a custom. Um, we. It's based on Kabbalah. You probably heard of Kabbalah. Kabbalah is the mysticism of the Torah of Judaism. Um, it's hard to explain right now, but basically, is um, when we pray or when we do certain holy things, we have to have an extra cover for our head. The yarmulke, the kippah, the one that you probably more familiar with. It's a cover that we always have to show respect for the one above, to show that there is one behind, uh, beyond us, beyond us. And uh, the one extra, it's 
related to some uh, uh, spiritual uh, 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 situation when we, we pray or do th certain things we want to have an extra cover Now, a Hasidic, a Hasidic is a sect in, in Orthodox. In, inside the Orthodox. Right. It's more than one. Uh, 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 it's uh, not necessarily more strict. Um, I mean, in every population, you have those who take th things you more strict, more less, though less. But um, Hasidic, you have people who are more ex strict than Hasidic. Um, but they're not Hasidic. The Hasidic, the Hasidic movement is the one who really um, focus on more uh, 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 personal connection with God, more uh, 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 spiritual uh, self-improvement uh, and stuff like that. More, more understanding. Some of, this, of, the, of the stuff I, 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 I taught today was taken from Hasidus from the teaching of the Hasidic movement, which is, uh, takes things and give them a deeper understanding, a more clear uh, uh, understanding, which is what I personally like. You don't like to do things and to just walk all your life in a way that you don't understand the beauty of it. But once you understand it, it's, it's much nicer. Yes. Um, the Torah, the Jewish law, speaks about a uh, certain things uh, that uh, the Jewish people in the desert already, before entering Israel, right after we left Egypt, um, certain things that they are allowed or not or not allowed to eat. Um, first of all, the Torah, the Bible counts a, uh, certain animals um, which are kosher, and those animals we are allowed to eat, and certain animals, I believe you, you know, for example, a, 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 a pig, a pork, whatever you call it, we don't eat. This is one, in, it's not in the list of the kosher animals, and even in the kosher animals, uh, uh, like like a cow or, or a sheep, uh, it depends the way it was done, it was prepared. Uh, we're not allowed to eat even to 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 swallow even a drop of of, of blood. So this is what makes the the. You probably all uh, uh, saw the kosher salt. Kosher salt. What means kosher salt? Salt is kosher. There's nothing to make uh, salt kosher. Kosher salt means that. We, it's more thicker salt. We, we use it to kosher the meat. Um, in, a, in a kosher places, kosher butcher, butcher shops, they take the meat after, when, before it's, it's ready to, to cook, to be cooked, and, and they put a lot of salt on it, and they soak it in salt, so the salt takes out all the blood, and then they rinse it and three times, so it's really um, clean, clean from, from any blood. Uh, so. You can eat a clean chicken, but if it was not processed in this way, for example, it's not kosher. So, I don't eat it. Um, now, the chicken can be kosher, or whatever meat can be kosher, and can't be mixed with, with dairy, if anything comes from milk. So, this is um, one of the challenges in a kosher kitchen, that we have full uh, two, pa two sets of, of, of everything, basically. Two different ovens, two different uh, 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 sets of pots and pans, dishes, and everything. If I ate something on, on a, something hot on a, on, a, on, a, on a plate, I ate meat, for example, I can't eat later something dairy, which even if the plate is clean, still absorbs some of the, of the taste of the meat and can go back to, the, to, my, to my dairy. So we we sep we com completely separ separating this. Um, this is a, I know sometimes we have guests and people who help in my house and uh, they have uh, sometimes hard time and you know they mix they they put they take you your dairy stuff and they put it in this and uh, this is uh, 
more or less what it's all about. Um, first of all, it's a godly a, a, a commandment. It's a divine commandment. God said, and, and uh, but for example, this uh, a, a combination of meat and, and dairy, it's considered one of, of the super-rational mitzvot, super-rational commandments. There is no... There is no clear explanation why it's not. Uh, and we have few commandments in the Torah which are not understood, not, not understandable, not, not explained. Um, and we still keep them. And we keep them with same excitement as those we understand. Uh, this is something to speak about. Uh, so I need another, another hour to speak about this. But um, um, I will say, just do say that whatever um, it's uh, kosher, it's healthier. Um, if, if, if not so much for the body, it's healthier for the, for the soul. So the one who created the world and created us and created our food knows what we should eat and not eat. Oh, I didn't know you were familiar with this. Um, yeah, I do. It, I do it every every uh, Friday night and every Saturday morning and afternoon. Yes, I am not uh, driving my car. Um, the logic is that the Sabbath, the Shabbat, the Jewish uh, Shabbat, is um, starts from Friday night and sunset, all all the way to to the following night of Saturday night. And the Torah, the Bible does say you shall not a, a, a kindle fire in that day, which is considered there are 30, 39 types of, of work which we are not, a, a, we are not a, supposed to do on these 24, 25 hours. Um, it's, a, a, it's an act of rest. So if you light, if you light fire, it's considered like you're creating something, you're doing something, and this is not something that we're not supposed to do in those 24 hours. So therefore, we're not riding, a, we're not driving a car since the car is running on fire. Is there a synagogue Yes. And if anyone here wanted to come and participate in study classes, or yes, yes. I, I unfortunately I don't have yet my business card. Uh, as I told you, I am uh, on uh, airport road. Um, if you want, you can give people my uh, my information later, and they can personally contact me. And yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Uh, it was the seventh one. Uh, in you see. It, you asked about uh, Hasidic. Um, in the Hasidic itself, there is something called Chabad that I mentioned. I am part of this. Um, it's, a cer it's a certain circle among the Hasidic circle, and um, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> Rabbi Schneerson was known as a great, great scholar, Torah scholar, and uh, also a scientist. And he uh, was a wise, wise man, um, unbelievably kind person who cared about every single person. Um, there's not right now. Pardon me. Yes, yes. He had no children. Um, when somebody once came to uh, some family came to see him and to see, to see actually his wife. Um, in in their house in uh, in their home in uh, in New York, so one of the children asked the wife of the rabbi, "We are your children." So she said, "In the temple, an Eastern Parkway, which is the center of Chabad over there." She meant to say, "All the all the people there, they are like our children." Okay, I guess. Um, if you have more questions, feel very free to contact me and uh, I'll be very happy to. Thanks.